Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for another opportunity, God, to look into your word, Father. I thank you, God, that we have it. I thank you that it is true. And I thank you, Father, that if we obey it, if we allow it to take real residence in our lives, we will live the lives by the power of your spirit that you always intended that we would live, God. And so I thank you, Father, that you have given us this opportunity to reflect on it. And I thank you, Father, for what it is that you will do uh, today, God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, it's wonderful to see you all here. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, you are actually joining on a great Sunday. But nonetheless, it's the last part of a four-week series that we have been going through on Standing Firm. Okay, and so I would encourage you, if you're interested, all of our recordings are online. Um, it's good to, to watch them in succession because they do build on each other, but you can find those uh, online or through our app, so we'd invite you to, to get that, all right? So as a quick recap, we started our series with Firm in Faith, Firm in Faith, and hence the tug of war rope. So what we said in week one was how important it is for us to cling with everything that we have to the faith that is true, okay? It's true. So we used the tug-of-war rope as the uh, illustration of, of what that is. And so how is it that we will hold and cling to this regardless of the different ideologies that go flying around out there or regardless of the things that maybe you and I were taught growing up that don't quite line up with what God's Word says. How is it that we're going to cling to this faith with everything that we have? And so the picture of the tug of war uh, sport was, I think, a good one. You know, it's not an easy sport. And holding on to our faith isn't easy. So we were talking about the fact that you and I are going to have to develop some calluses on our hands that help us to hold on regardless of what it is that we're facing. We were talking about how we have to have the right posture of digging our heels in and also looking back and seeing that there are others pulling on the same rope with us. Because if you and I were trying to do tug of war by ourselves, it would be a wash. It wouldn't work out very well. So we were talking about how important it is to hold on to our, uh, our faith. And then we talked about how important it was and sometimes difficult to stand firm in suffering. Okay, so it's one thing to hang on to the faith that is true. And we don't hold on to this faith because it's convenient. We hold on to it because it's true. We hold on to it because it represents what God's Word has always said. It represents His heart. And this faith does get us somewhere, but we don't do it just out of convenience as if living the Christian life is easy. And so then we have to take it to the next step of clinging to this rope when we go through suffering. Because many times, sometimes, oftentimes, that's the time that we're ready to drop the rope. Because everything is just too difficult, it's too hard, nobody understands, my situation's unique, God, why did you allow this? And I get all of those things. I've been through that myself, and I know I'm not alone. But it's at those times that we have to cling, sometimes even more so, to the faith that we know to be true. Again, we don't cling to it in hopes that all of our sadness from losing a loved one or whatever it is that we're facing just goes away, because it doesn't work like that. We cling to it because it's true. We cling to it because it represents God's heart to us and the things that he has in store whilst we go through difficult circumstances. So we talk about standing firm in suffering. Last week, we looked at firm in righteousness. So we were talking about how important it is for us to understand that it is literally God's will for us to live a righteous life, a right life. Living our lives from the right line is another way you can look at it. And it's not a human line. It's God's line. It's God's standard. It's God's word. And so we, we, we talked about the fact sometimes in the Christian experience, we might ask God a lot of questions. Like, God, what is your will for me in this situation? What is your will for me in terms of getting married or my job and all of that? And all of those things are what we should do. But when we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, I may get the reference wrong, I apologize, but it specifically reminds us that this is God's will that you would live a righteous life. And we we're talking about sexual immorality, etc. 
It's God's will, okay? And so what we are finishing up today with is firm in the future, firm in the future. How is it that we can not just stand firm in the faith that we know to be true, not just how is it that we stand firm when the suffering comes, and it will, how is it that we don't just intend or, by God's help, stand firm in righteous living, but how does understanding the future help us to stand firm in anticipation for it? So that's how we're going to end today, okay? And so this is the statement that's going to sort of guide our conversations this morning. We have faith in a future that is secured in Christ, who will return for his church and establish an eternal kingdom. This is something that's going to happen. Jesus Christ is going to come back. It's going to happen. Now, sometimes I think it's very easy to get lost in the, well, I put my faith in the historical orthodoxy of what Jesus Christ really did, which was he came as a little baby. The Bible teaches us that historically many other uh, uh, papers and books and, and history of the day tells us that this man, Jesus, really did live. He really did die. He really did come back to life. There was a movement that really, really started, and we are all in in terms of putting our faith in what Jesus did for us. Praise God. The thing that we cannot divorce is what God says about the future, because it's the same Jesus. The same Jesus who came as a little baby, the exact same, there's no difference, there's no split in God's mind as the Jesus came once, and Jesus, it's all part of the same package. So as surely as your salvation and my salvation rest in the historical fact that Jesus did something on our behalf, and we put our faith in what he did, is as sure as our faith continues with what God says about the future. There's no divorce there. There's no divorce. We're living in the in-between. Jesus died, and Jesus is coming back. But the only hope that we have is in what Jesus did. And so that same hope in the same package is he's coming back. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. So when we think about that, a couple things that should really sort of prick our mind or sharpen our minds, in the, in the early Testament church, you hear Paul and all of the apostles as he's teaching, he constantly is saying, Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back, Jesus is coming back. Now, this is a reality that they were looking forward to 2,000 plus years ago. Now, you and I, we live closer to that reality because we're now 2,000 years plus past when they were still anticipating Christ coming back. But the question that you and I, I think, have to wrestle through and be honest about is how much anticipation do we have that Jesus is coming back when we compare it to the way that Paul taught it when he was on earth? Like Paul was literally teaching, listen, Jesus could come back any time. Are you ready? That's literally how they lived. And so, in, 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 in a real respect, they didn't really get uh, caught up in all of the trappings of the day, which were... They were real. I think we think that we live in a very sophisticated, intellectual, and busy, distracting scenario, and rightly so, but they did too. And their whole outlook, as Paul taught it, was, listen, Jesus is coming back. Do what you got to do. Be responsible. Live your lives before people. All of that stuff, because that's part of being the testimony of Jesus. But if you lose sight of the fact that Jesus is coming back, you're going to start slipping into the worldly habits of, well, this is what I'm living for. And so, for us, how often do you really think about Jesus coming back? I have to ask myself that sometimes, you know. I think about whether or not it's raining and whether or not I'm going to get wet on my bike more than I think, well, Jesus might come back today. Just being honest. But... When Paul wrote it and he taught it, he literally would leave his house. I mean, I'm speculating in some respects, but he literally went forward thinking, this could be the day. This could literally be the day that Jesus is coming back. That's how he lived. That's how he taught. Many of us have hopes, right? 
we, we have this idea, and, and, and you know, I'm hoping I'm going to get a, a, a new car, or I'm hoping that I get a new job, or I hope I get a new relationship, or those things. And there's nothing wrong with hoping. But at the same time, hope pulls this anticipation in us that says, I can't wait until it happens. And nothing really shifts between hoping for it and getting it in terms of the anticipation. It should only grow. Because it's not a hope, well, I just hope. It's a hope that says, you know what? I know it's coming. I know it's coming. For some of you, it's just like, I know when my last day of this job is, and I'm hoping. That's true. I know that's true. Some of you, you can laugh all you want. You, you find that your hope is rested in something ending, so God might do something new for you. But the anticipation... Every day, getting closer to that day, every hour, it's just like, okay, this, or maybe a vacation or something like that. Anticipation grows. It grows and grows. And so, however it is that we got into the state that we're in, and I'm not judging you, I'm going to answer for myself, we have to be honest about what we anticipate, what we expect, and the way in which our desire grows in that anticipation. That's how Paul wrote. That's how he lived. That's how he taught. And he was teaching a church who had all of these struggles, persecution, all these ideologies, and all of the other stuff that they had to navigate. And in all of that, they were expected to live righteous lives. They were expected to, 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 to be good representatives of God. But all the time, still living in the moment which says, Jesus could come back today. Jesus could come back today. This is what Paul says in verse 13, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep or those who have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or those who have died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive who are left until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep or those who have died before us. For the Lord himself will descend with heaven, from heaven, sorry, with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Amen. Amen. No, it's, it's, it's probable or maybe even obvious that Paul is needing to address some questions that this church had. Okay? So never think that questions should be off the table. If somebody is unwilling to hear a question that you have regarding God and all the rest of it and it comes with arrogance, well, go find somebody else. Okay, so this is a question that they would have had. It's just like, well, Paul, what about Auntie Jean? Like, she's not here with us anymore. Like, wh what am I supposed to expect? Because in that culture, there were lots of different ideas. Well, one of the Gnostic teachings was the fact that flesh was evil and spirit was good. And like, how do you reconcile all this stuff? So Paul, he doesn't bash him. He said, well, again, speculating, reading into it. Say, no worries, let me tell you how it goes, because this is important stuff. You need to know this. And so Paul goes on to explain that. So those who died, when Jesus comes back, they're going to be resurrected first. They're not going to, we're not, if we're alive when Christ comes back, we're not going to beat those who have died first. They're going to come back. We're going to meet them. We're all going to be in the air together with Jesus. And the awesome thing about this, some theologians see the picture, uh, which is referenced all through the New Testament, of Jesus and the glory that is in the church, is that is this spectacle that takes place. Think about it. I mean, the dead in Christ will rise first. Those who are alive will come after that. And then together, all of the saints will be in heaven, in the air. And many theologians think or feel or interpret it in as much as that's the glory of the church being on display for everybody to see. Just in the air. I, I can't picture that. But that's what is going to happen. And so, after Paul sympathetically, I want to say, just describes that, because that's a real question. 
He says, listen, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Now, when you read through this, sometimes you can read through it very quickly, right? We focus on the first part. Of, but this is a huge statement. We will always be with the Lord. Always. There will be no gaps. It, we will always, when Jesus Christ returns, the dead in Christ will rise. Those who are still alive, caught up. From that moment until eternity, we will never be separated from Jesus Christ. We'll never be separated from Jesus Christ. And then Paul says, encourage each other with these words. No, there are other words that you can encourage each other with, but this is not what Paul says. Paul says, listen, this is such a critical question. You have to know how it goes. Just because I'm telling you the answer doesn't mean that automatically you feel better because you're still missing this person and this, but I'm telling you that this is how it goes. But let me also tell you this. When we all meet Jesus, we will never, ever be separated from him again. That's what the Bible teaches. Never. So, when you and I go through the worst of the worst, encourage yourself with these words. Encourage yourself with these words. I'm not saying that as a flip switch, oh, everything's fine and I'm good and all. Ah, you still got to work through some emotions. I get that. But encourage yourself with this divine fact that when we see Jesus Christ, we will never, ever be separated from him again. No, in a real way, the Bible teaches that we're not even separated from him now because the Holy Spirit of God lives in us, and he bears witness that we are the children of God. But Paul is talking about a real physical reality and answering a question that many would have had. And this is exactly what Jesus says when he was on earth. He said, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. So we do not lose heart. This is Paul talking in Corinthians. So this is Jesus. Jesus is telling his disciples that in this world you can have some trouble. We reflected on these verses earlier. But this is exactly what Jesus said. Like he's saying, listen, guys, you've gotten to know me. You have accepted me as the Messiah. You have accepted me when everybody else still rejected me. Do you really think that I'm going to leave you and not come back for you? Do you really think that if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm not coming back to get you? Like, do you really think that? That's what is going on in Jesus' heart and mind as he's sharing these last moments with his disciples and these last instructive words. Now, lest you think that I think these words should solve all of your emotional issues, I'm not saying that. When you lose somebody, it's hard. When you have a perspective that says, I still miss that person, it's hard. As a believer, you still want to stay focused, but at times you stay focused on what heaven promises, but on the empty bed that's next to it. You get caught in between. That's just real. And that's where we need God's grace to help us and stabilize us in the gap. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, we need to stay encouraged because Jesus said, if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back. He's coming back. He's coming back. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. He says, so we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentarily affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Now, I think you have to be careful when you read through Scripture because sometimes, at least my thought here, would be sometimes we could feel as if like Jesus in the last verse is just being harsh and telling me just get on with life. Or Paul's just saying, what, you're being a wimp. And yeah, that's not. This is just it's, it's poetic language. But Paul's heart's in it. He's just saying, listen, I know it's hard. I can attest to it. I know it's hard. He's not being insensitive. He's just stating facts. 
The reality of what we experience, the grief, the losses, the hurt, the suffering, when compared to the glory that will be revealed, there is no comparison. There is no comparison. He goes on and he says this, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, but the things that are unseen, they're eternal. They're eternal. And so, the things that you and I see, they're real, they're physical, they're real, but they're temporal. They're temporal. The things that are eternal, they're the things that are really there, but we aren't in that space to see it all yet, and so it's a difficult comparison to make, but so Paul is teaching, it's there whilst we have to navigate the transient stuff. Let's not set our hopes in it because it's temporal. Let's set our hopes on the eternal things that are unseen. We've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, there are many other scriptures that remind us or teach us, instruct us specifically, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. But the challenge is we don't know when. We don't know when. Right? Some people want to try to prophesy and calculate numbers and this and that and the other. Listen, the Bible says categorically that Jesus is coming back, but no man knows the hour. Okay? That's just what the Bible says. And so a couple things to keep in mind, even as we looked last week about uh, being firm in righteous living, because you and I don't know when Jesus Christ is coming back, this firmness in righteous living it might be a long time. So you got to dig in and get ready sort of for the long haul because we don't know when Jesus is coming back. He could come back while we are still living. He might give us time to live out four score and 20. And however long that is, since we don't know, we have to live each day as if it's the day Jesus is coming back. That's what Paul is teaching and reminds us. He says, now concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. And this is what Jesus says. He says the exact same words. Jesus said this, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will be the coming of the Son of Man." Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken and one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and one left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. I think Jesus says it at least three different ways that nobody knows. And so if you meet somebody or if you listen to something that says, I know, I know, I know, dismiss it. Just dismiss it. Like, it's, it's just, it, nobody knows. Jesus Christ himself, God in the flesh, he doesn't know the hour. No, for whatever reason, in the council of the Trinity, that's just the way that it is. But Jesus is sharing what he knows to be true, and it says, I don't even know. My Father, our Heavenly Father, he's going to look over me, over to me one day and say, Jesus, it's time. And that is the time in which I will know it's time. So anybody on earth who is speculating and this and, 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 and the, the amount of prophecies who or persons have, have gone through and they made a prophecy and then, well, it didn't happen on that day. Okay, well, what happened? Well, you know, the moon wasn't aligned right and I miscalculated. <laughs> and so they make another prophecy. And then, you know, we're laughing. It's, it's true stuff. Like people, to, so every time you call them out as to, well, what happened? Oh, well, you know, and then they make another one. And then they make another one. Jesus said, nobody knows. Nobody knows. So you can be the greatest mathematician and all the rest of it. You'd still be wrong. And if you got it right by chance, it would surely be by luck. Because nobody knows 
when Jesus is coming back. And so how is it that we ought to live as followers of his not knowing? Stay awake. That's what Jesus says here. Stay awake for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Stay alert. Stay alert. Stay alert. Every day. Every day. One of the challenges I think for me um, it's, it's interesting, I guess, being a pastor because, generally speaking, my world is surrounded by wonderful Christians and we're all going in the same direction, right? That's the staff and the like. And most of my time is spent between, um, you know, in the office, I leave home to come here and I meet with persons, etc. But I'm not really in the marketplace. And so, for me sometimes, it's like, like well, Joe, are you... Are you Staying awake? Are you looking for the opportunities to share the gospel? I look for the opportunities to encourage each other. I'm a pastor. That's what I do. But are you looking for the opportunities to encourage people in the community, your neighbors and the like? And honestly speaking, not all the time. And, you know, it's something the Lord's pricking me. So it's like, well, Joe, you know, yeah, I got this for you to do, but you're going to meet people. Like, you better be ready. Like, stay alert. may not be every day. may not be every person. But stay alert, because, you know, you're my child, I'm asking you to do this, but what I'm asking you to do isn't who you are. You're my child, and I can put you anywhere at any time, and you need to be alert. You need to be alert. Part of this alertness has to do, I think, with the anticipation that Jesus is coming back. Now, as we sit here, and I'm not going to ask for any hands or anything, right? Right? But honestly, from, from your heart to God's heart, or even just let it reflect on sort of where you are, when you hear the words, Jesus is coming back, does that bring joy or is it disappointing to say, you know what, don't come back until this thing gets fixed, <laughs> or don't come back, I'm being honest, right? We invest a lot of emotion in stuff. We invest a lot of finance in stuff. We invest a lot in a lot. And that's not to say that it's bad stuff. But would you be disappointed if Jesus told you, which we know he isn't, I'm just speculating, if he told you that I'm coming back on this day, like, would you have to reorder everything? Or have you and I been living our lives with this anticipation that says, you know what? Jesus, if you come back and this hasn't finished or my house isn't finished or this job or this relationship, I'm good because that's what I've been looking for all along? It's a very probing question, right? I think about that. Right now, we're hoping to get a new car soon. Our car gave out on us, but we're thankful. Now, do I want the car before Jesus comes back? Well, I don't, I, 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 I don't know, but, <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm looking forward to a little more normalcy and, 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 and the like, but... I like, we laugh about this stuff, but seriously, this is stuff I have had to sit in. Like I told you, I'm a bit of a gadget freak, right? I like my little gadgets. Unfortunately, with the, um, anyway, I'm able to get some through the, the plan and stuff, right? But like, okay, I'm looking forward to the new iPhone. I know that sounds funny, right? That's how you know how to pray for me. But <laughs> it's like, I know what it's going to do, and I know this, and oh, it's the new, and new, and new. Like, okay, well... Do I want that before Jesus? Like, is that, what do I think about the most? What do we think about the most? That's my confession. There you go, got your hand. So we'll, that's another. It's like, have you ever uh, maybe reacquainted with a friend from college, somebody from way back, right? And you um, just, you know, you always were good, but you just got away from each other, life happens, all the rest of it. And now you have this opportunity to reconnect, right? And in reconnecting, you determine that, you know what, I'm going to invite this person over to this place, my home, or what have you, and we're going to have a great time. But you haven't really nailed down the time that they're going to arrive. You know, they're flying in, and you sort of got a free day, and it's all good. So you're inside, you're looking forward to seeing this person, but you don't know exactly when they're coming. So question, based on the information that you share with this person, do you take a trip and say, well, I guess when they get her, they'll call me? Or do you stay vigilant to say, you know what, let me look out, I ain't seen them yet. 
no, not yet. Or the dog starts barking. Oh, maybe that's them. You run to the door. There's, there's this level of anticipation in the gap which says, I know it's going to happen. I'm not quite sure when, but I want to stay vigilant. So any car that goes by, here's some brakes. Oh, I think, oh, that wasn't there. All right, cool. But it's not time to go and take a nap because you know that something is about to happen. You just don't know exactly when. So the anticipation that should grow in us. Now, this whole anticipation that we ought to have and that we're learning to have, and I'm trusting that even as we leave here, having done this four weeks, will grow all the more. It's a reality because Jesus Christ, because of what he did, he died, he rose again, He's now seated on the right hand of the majesty on high, representing us. We are his children for those of us who have put our faith and trust in him. What that reality is only possible because we have been delivered from darkness into light. We have been saved. We've been redeemed. We have been snatched off of the black market of sin, and we have been made the righteousness of Christ. We have been changed. And so that's sort of what Paul picks up. In verse 4, he says, but you are not in darkness, brothers and sisters, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Like, it's going to come like a thief. He already told us that. But it shouldn't surprise you as if you are now vulnerable because it's going to happen, because this is the way you and I should be living our lives. It shouldn't surprise you, for you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. And Paul's point is simply this, we have to stay awake. Now, sometimes I think we can use that idea to say, well, I need to stay awake so that I don't miss any of my ministry obligations at church. Or I need to stay awake so that I don't miss out on my Bible reading plan because I hate when that check's not checked. All of that stuff's great. But what the immediate context of what Paul is teaching about here is that Jesus is coming back. So if you are reading Scripture and, and, and ministry obligations, all that as a means of continuing to focus on Jesus coming back and what he wants me to do now, praise God. But the alertness has to do with this thing's going to happen. Jesus is going to come back. He's literally going to come back, as literally as, as literal as he was when he came as a baby. He's coming back. So when we look at life and the difficulties and the challenges, Paul would say this from Romans 5 through to 8. He says, we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And the question always comes up, at least from my heart and my mouth, is God, I, I, I want perseverance, I want endurance, but could we do it another way? <laughs> right, could, you, could, we, could we figure this out another way? But again, we have to look back at the picture of Jesus himself. Hebrews teaches us that Jesus learned obedience through the sufferings that he endured. Peter would say the same thing. Paul says the same thing. And so, my encouragement is that it's not a marathon, right? Or it's not a sprint, I should say. It's a marathon. It's, it's, it's a marathon. It's a marathon. But it's a marathon worth winning because even now as we're running, we know where the finish line is, and we also know that we win whether or not you're first in the marathon or number 300. You win. You win. You win. You win. So let's stay uh, sober. This was what Paul's whole message to this church was, and it's so applicable to us as well. It's easy, I think, at times to look at the Bible as outdated and old-fashioned, and the pictures that come to mind are people wearing weird clothes and stuff like that. But it's the principles that God laid down for real people in a real time, living in a broken world in which we still live in. And as surely as this encouragement was for that church in Thessalonica, it's for us as well. You and I, we have to stand firm. 
we have to stand for it. So as we get ready to close, just a quick reflection on where we've been. We started with firm in faith. And my question would be, what are some tangible, specific things that you can do and I can do to help us to keep on holding on, to keep on gripping? Tangible stuff, right? How is it that this idea of standing firm in our faith is not just going to be a bullet point in a sermon, but a reality in our lives? How is it, how is it that we're going to do that? And we'll talk through that a bit more on Tuesday. I mean that. So come on. This is where we unpack things a little bit. Like, what does it look like? What does it look like? What does it look like to be the only Christian in your home and you're still trying to hold on to this faith? What does it look like to be in a certain kind of company environment where the norm of the day is we just roll over people and we keep on going? And they expect me to do it that way. How, how, what does it look like? What does it look like? What can we do? Who can you link with? What does it look like? For me, like, what does it look like to do this in my neighborhood? Got a great neighborhood, some wonderful people around there, but got to take more opportunity. Firm in faith. Firm in faith. And then firm in suffering. What does it look like? To grip this thing even more so when we go through difficult times. You know, when the doctor's report comes and all you want to do is just drop the rope or the child goes astray or like, how do you do that? How do you grip this all the more? Firm and suffering. Because there's one thing to think about the, the what ifs and the I thinks and I think we need to and all the rest, but if we don't go to the next step of how to do it, or not even thinking about that, then it's just going to be a theoretical thing, which may be good in some spaces, but not practical. So how do we actually do this? How do we actually do this? Firm and righteous living. How do I hold on to my faith when everybody is laughing at me because I say I'm a virgin? Like, everybody is telling me what they're doing with everybody else. How is it? that I'm supposed to hold on to my faith when righteous living is the thing that God says is his will for my life. Like, how do I do that? How do I do that when I go to parties and everybody is using a certain app or going to a certain website because that's fun, but it has a whole lot of stuff that I have no business seeing, right? How do I do that? How do I do that? And then today, firm in the future, how do I hold on to this faith in a world that will quite frankly tell you that you're a fanatical nut job because you still believe in Jesus? It's been my experience. I'm sure I'm not alone. Right? Like, you still believe that? Yeah, you know why? Because it's still true. I didn't say that it's always convenient for me because the Bible shreds me up like nothing. But it's still true. It's still true. So you believe that Jesus is coming back? Yeah. Because if it weren't for Jesus, I wouldn't be saved in the first place. And so if he did it in the first instance and he tells me he's coming back, I believe that too. Absolutely. How do we stay firm? future. And how do we allow that firmness in the future to be a source of encouragement to us today? How do you do that? Because we're not into just playing patchwork and saying, well, let's put a band-aid there and Jesus is coming back, so I guess my emotions doesn't matter. God loves everything about us, the emotions and all of it, and he has grace for that. But as we grip this rope, how is it that we're going to allow the hope of the future, Jesus Christ, to be a source of encouragement to us today? And quite frankly, that's how Paul lived. I'm reminded in Philippians where Paul would say, you know, he's having this conversation with the Philippians and he's saying, listen, um, if it were up to me, I'm summarizing, but if it were up to me, 
I would go home to be with Jesus. Like, I, I'm, I'm done. I, you don't really feel as if there's a depressed state or anything. It's just like, look, I, there, nothing compares to being with Jesus. But he goes on and he says, I'm convinced, having spent time with Jesus, that that's not his plan for me right now. He wants me to remain for your good. I'm going to keep at it and all the rest of it. But if you're asking me, Jesus, nothing compares to that. So is Paul being morbid? Is he being depressed? Is he being, no, he's just being realistic to say, you know what? I think that God wants me to stay here for your benefit. But if it were up to me, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It's, it's, it's Jesus. It's been Jesus when he saved me. It's Jesus now. And it's Jesus in the future. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. So I'm going to be quiet for a minute. All right? And uh, just let, I guess, our conversation sit in a little bit and see what God might be probing you. And as you ask yourselves questions, I really want to encourage you, Ask the practical ones. What does this mean for me? Like, what does it mean for me to stand firmer in my faith? What does that look like? What's that look like? And maybe you don't have a, a big theological answer. Whatever, that's fine. But starting with those questions is the first step. You know, what does it look like for me to cling on a whole lot more during suffering? Right? What does it look like for me to stand firm in righteous living with a crazy world all around me? And what does it look like for me to stand firm or firmer in the future promises of what God will do? All right, so that's for you. Let's do some business with God from our heart to God's. As we get ready to, to leave here, I don't want this to be, I'm debating whether or not I should even go this way, but I, I don't want this to be a gimmicky type thing as I talk about Explore Cornerstone, so just hear my heart. What I have come to understand in my own life is how much I need people, right? How, how much I need to be uh, moving in the circles with the same people who are moving in the same direction that I'm going in. And that represents the church. If it's a good church, if it's a God-honoring church, that's the whole point of it. So even as we talk about Explore Cornerstone, listen, I, I don't want it to be a weird thing, but I'm going to say what I'm going to say anyway. If you are contemplating what it looks like to settle in and to be surrounded by a group of people who are going in the direction, keeping heaven in mind, and before God, as best I can, and I'll speak for Pastor Avesley on this behalf as well, we're going to teach you God's Word. Like, I don't know how to do anything else. And I just want to encourage you, like, why don't you hang out for a little bit? Because if you don't connect and stay connected, even if it's not here, that's fine, whatever. But if you don't stay connected or get connected, it's going to be very difficult for you to stay firm in your faith. Because there's just too much stuff out there. It, it, it just is. It's going to be very difficult for you to cling even harder to that rope of faith when the thing that you're not expecting comes next week or what have you. That's just, it's just true. It's going to be very difficult for you to stand firm in righteous living if you're depending on yourself to bring about that righteousness. Yes, I know that the Holy Spirit of God lives in every believer. Praise God, I know it, I believe it. But that same Holy Spirit has authored his word which says we need each other. And how is it that you're going to stand firm in the future when the persons that you perhaps, work-wise or otherwise, are thinking that you are nut for thinking that heaven and hell is real? You better come alongside some people who understand the orthodoxy of God's word, believe it, and continue to go in that direction. And so I, I think in a real way, that's what, um, you know, membership is all about. That's what the fellowship is all about. Um, and I'm excited about what God's doing. But again, if, if you haven't signed up and you just want to hang out and sit, hey, just, just do that. Plan to do that, okay? Well, I should get a sandwich anyway.
Professor Eversley, I'm going to ask you to pray if you would in like 30 seconds, please. You could come up. You could come up. I just want to give you a, a quick uh, prayer, prayer for us. We have faith in a future that is secured in Christ who will return for his church and he will establish an eternal kingdom. It's going to happen. As surely as I'm standing here and you're sitting there on February the 4th, 2024, Jesus Christ is going to come back. All right. Amen. Amen. This is weird because I knew he was going to ask me to do this. I'm not joking. Um, one point I want to make before. Two minutes, okay? My When I was in my late teens, my, we were, my brother and I were here. My parents went away. They said they'll be back in two weeks to tell us exactly when they were coming. The house was a mess from the day that they left to the day that they came back. We cleaned it up right before they came back. Right? Our house was out of order because we knew when they were coming back. And so we got it back in order right before they came. If they would have said to us, we're not sure when we're coming back. We're coming back. We could come back tomorrow. We could come back the day after. We would have kept our house in order every single day day because we were expecting their return and because we do not anticipate Jesus's return we allow our houses our spiritual lives to get out of order and think about this imagine if he returns and your spiritual house is a mess imagine if he returns and your spiritual house is a mess and the reason it's a mess is because you don't have in mind that he could come back tomorrow and I was sitting there, and I knew he was going to ask me to pray. I, I'm serious. As soon as this story came to my mind, I knew he was going to ask me to pray. This is God. Father, living with the anticipation of your return is so important. God, if we have no expectation that you could come back tomorrow, then the likelihood of us allowing our spiritual homes to be in disarray is, is huge. And God, we have seen reminder after reminder that we need to keep in the forefront of our minds that you could come back at any time. And God, with that in mind, I pray that our, when you come back, our lives would be found to be aligned with your word. And that is doing all the things that we need to do. But God, even more than that, I pray that our lives would be found in a deep relationship with you. Not neglecting what we need to do, but not neglecting time with you. Not neglecting getting to know you. Not neglecting, God, developing our first love. Father, I thank you for the messages that we've heard concerning standing firm. And Lord, as we said earlier, you don't speak about standing firm unless there is something that's coming to, to knock you over. Like nobody says in peace that people were standing firm because standing firm was not even necessary. There was no opposition. But God, there is more and more opposition and I pray, God, this world needs people who believe in you that are not moved by what it is they see or hear. But people who look at your word and say, I know that it is true. And I don't care what people say. I don't care about any other opinion. But rather, I will stand firm on your word. Because it was true from the beginning. And it will be true in all of eternity. Thank you, God. And again, God, I pray. That we would be in each other's lives. Not busy bodies, not but rather in each other's lives, encouraging each other with these words. Father, even as he read that, I thought in my mind, when was the last time I encouraged anybody in the body of Christ with any of these words? 
This is instruction from your word to encourage each other with these words. I pray, God, that we would take what your word says seriously and not just stand firm, but also assist those of us around us to stand firm as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.